here. Good morning. Yes. Dr. Richard Nagelbaum received his education at Yale University in Montreal, Canada. He now directs the Institute of Human Nutrition at Columbia University, where he holds professorship in nutrition, pediatrics, and epidemiology. In addition to his ongoing basic research in cell biology, lipids, cardiovascular disease, and issues of human nutrition, he has been active in translating basic science findings to practical application in different populations. He has chaired numerous task forces, including the AHA, the WHO, and served in advisory committees, including those with the NIH, the FDA, and the U.S. Dietary Guidelines Committee. Dr. Deckelbaum has directed novel econutrition task forces and activities integrating health, nutrition, ecology, and agriculture. Early in his career, he was a physician in Zambia, and afterwards helped establish the first children's hospital in the West Bank of Georgia and then continued to organize research and health programs among Egyptian, Palestinian, and Israeli populations. He co-founded the Medical School of International Health in Israel in affiliation with Columbia University Medical Center. Dr. Dekelbaum was president of the Global Health Foundation Education Consortium and a board member of the Consortium of Universities for Global Health. In addition to other awards and honors, he has received Lifetime Achievement Awards by the GHEC and by McGill University. He participates in planning and coordinating nutrition education, policy, and research programs in the Middle East, Asia, and Africa. Dr. Nekobov promotes that is active in research projects related to health and science as a bridge between different populations nationally and internationally. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Richard Nekobov. Thank you very much, uh, Raphael, and uh, morning, everyone. It's good to uh, be uh, on this side of town. Uh, the photograph you see is the Institute of Human Nutrition. And uh, what the Institute does is uh, different than a department. We're not, not a department at Columbia, but we actually have faculty from 20 different departments, uh, basic science, clinical, um, School of Public Health, and uh, we pull nutrition together at Columbia University. Um, and today I'm going to be talking uh, about uh, aspects of the fishy problems with omega-3 fatty acids. And uh, what we'll do is review a bit of the history, some of the biochemistry and metabolism, some basic research and then we'll really get into the human dilemmas. Um, so I have a question here. How many people here eat fish at least twice a week? Okay. How many people here take omega-3 supplements? Aha. Okay, well, let's get to the end of the talk and We'll see who's right. Uh, no real disclosures. And uh, on this slide, we see members of my lab who uh, have been or are the Omega-3 team. And I think you'll see on the slide that there may be other things that could be healthy aside from Omega-3s. Well, omega-3 fatty acids uh, actually go back <coughs> a long way. So if we begin with Hippocrates about 400 BC, he talked about the medicinal uses of uh, uh, fish and fish oils. Then we move to about ooh, 50 AD with uh, Pliny the Elder in Rome. And uh, he actually wrote on dolphin liver oil um, being good for certain skin conditions. And then on your right, we get to the 1700s where uh, cod liver oil was reported to have benefits in symptoms that would be associated with, I guess, uh, rheumatism and rheumatoid arthritis. It's interesting when you look in PubMed uh, actually, I looked last night. Uh, 
And right now there's close to 22,000 publications uh, relating to omega-3 fatty acids. And you see the, the big interest really started in the 80s and 90s with a really explosion of publications uh, coming in uh, the last 15, 20 years relating to omega-3 fatty acids. And a lot of it uh, relates to the different controversies that go on with omega-3 fatty acids. So uh, lipids and fat uh, are not just good calorically dense nutrients, uh, but they have uh, quite a few biologic uh, actions which we'll be talking about over the next uh, few minutes. Uh, and uh, the omega-3 fatty acids, well, are they really different? Are they really different than other types of fatty acids? So here <coughs> we're going to do uh, uh, fatty acids 101 and look at the biosynthesis of the omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids. And what you can see on this slide is that really we have to start with the essential fatty acids for the omega-6 series, which uh, is uh, linoleic acid, 18 carbons, two double bonds. And for the omega-3 series, uh, alpha linolenic acid, 18 carbons, three double bonds. So the, they're, the omega-6 and omega-3 series are <coughs> defined by having the first double bond uh, in omega-6, six carbons away from the methyl terminal, and the omega-3, three, three, uh, three carbons, the first double bond is three carbons away. So if we start with the omega-6, which you find in safflower oil, soy, uh, a lot of vegetable oils, um, they get elongated and desaturated till you get to this uh, fatty acid, which is arachidonic acid, which is 20 carbons, four double bonds. And in general, in ge oh, there it is, uh, in general, the byproducts, if you will, of arachidonic acid tend to be pro-inflammatory, lead to higher inflammatory states. Now, if you start with the omega-3 series, alpha linolenic acid, so even fish have to get <coughs> their uh, essential fatty acid from alpha linolenic acid. And where do you find it? You find it in krill, which are baby shrimp, and uh, I think when they're babies, they're still kosher, but uh, who knows. And uh, then, uh, and, and in algae, uh, uh, and uh, as you'll see, we'll see alpha linolenic's not all that uh, bioactive. But then they use the same enzymes here to elongate and desaturate. Uh, to double bonds till they get to EPA 25, which is a potent anti-inflammatory, uh, anti-apoptotic uh, fatty acid, uh, which decreases inflammation. And then there's further elongation and desaturation to DHA, docohexanoic acid, <coughs> which uh, actually forms 50% of the fatty acids of the retina, and depending on the phospholipid subspecies, 15 to 22 percent of the fatty acids in the brain. And so they're important structurally, but also EPA and DHA are very potent anti-inflammatory, uh, anti-apoptotic uh, uh, molecules. And, uh, you can see here because they share the same enzymes for desaturation and elongation that you can, by substrate inhibition, if you have too much omega-6, for example, in intravenous feeding, you'll actually decrease the synthesis of the omega-3 long chains from uh, uh, alpha linolenic acid. So are all these omega-3 fatty acids equal? And 
a lot of, when you go into over-the-counter stuff, uh, you'll see a lot of things labeled al uh, omega-3, and they're really containing large amounts of alpha-linolenic acid, the precursor of EPA and DHA. And if we look on this slide, we can see that the precursor, alpha-linolenic acid, and compared to EPA and DHA, have different physiologic effects. So this is a study that came out a while ago on giving male volunteers uh, either alpha-linolenic acid or EPA and DHA, and measuring uh, inflammatory markers, in this case uh, IL-6 uh, after uh, LPS. Uh, and we can see here that if we look at the percent change in this pro-inflammatory cytokine uh, IL-6, that with placebo and alpha-linolenic acid, you really had no change. And the only really marked effects were with the combination of EPA and DHA. So EPA and DHA are much more bioactive in most populations than are uh, the essential fatty acid precursor alpha-linolenic acid. So if we look at omega-3 fatty acids in cell biology, uh, what I've done here on this slide is in the, I guess it's orangish, uh, stress the different pathways that my own lab has studied up at Columbia University, but the uh, omega-3 fatty acids are important for membrane structure and function because they're long and they're unsaturated. They keep fish able to swim in just about freezing waters in the North uh, Atlantic. Uh, they have, as I said, uh, anti-inflammatory and anti-apoptotic things. They uh, de uh, decrease uh, coagulation response. And they're very important in different signaling pathways, cellular metabolic pathways. They regulate genes. And uh, as I'll show you, um, they actually uh, act as antioxidants, uh, and they have marked effects in mitochondrial function uh, that we've uncovered in our studies at Columbia. What about their roles in human health? Well, they've been suggested in infant formulas, as you know, are uh, sort of topped up in the United States with DHA to improve cognitive development and learning, although recent studies show that by the age of eight years, there's no difference between fortified uh, kids who have been on fortified formulas versus not. But they are important, actually, in premature babies in terms of improving outcomes later. Uh, visual development, uh, better pregnancy outcomes in terms of longer, <coughs> well, uh, uh, a few days extra in pre pregnancy, perhaps in some cancers, metabolic syndrome, but not type 2 diabetes, uh, inflammatory immune responses. Uh, they delay the onset of neurological degeneration, mental disorders, macular uh, degeneration, uh, but they don't reverse it once it's established. And in fact, the only approved use for omega-3 fatty acids uh, by the FDA is for hypertriglyceridemia with triglyceride levels greater than 500 milligram percent. Uh, there's controversies and discussions now whether it should be used uh, with mild hypertriglyceridemia from 200 to 500. Uh, but the interesting thing is uh, we're still waiting for effects of actual clinical outcomes in terms of cardiovascular disease and reversing hypertriglyceridemia. Uh, we'll talk briefly about non-alcoholic li fatty liver disease, which my lab has worked on, and then we'll spend more time on cardiovascular disease, including myocardial infarction and stroke. Uh, so uh, most of my own work, uh, I'm a pediatrician, so I work on small animals or peoples, and most of my own work at Columbia is related to uh, what we do with mice. And uh, we've done quite a few dietary studies, uh, different kinds of mice from, these are sort of control black six mice, LDL receptor knockout, fatty acid uh, transporter knockout, APOE, it's insulin resistant mice. 
And what we, we do with these mice is we give them different diets. And we give them a chow diet, which is sort of the regular mouse uh, rat diet, which is relatively low in fat, low in cholesterol. <clears throat> then we give them the Western diet, a saturated fat diet, which is the McDonald's diet, which is uh, high in saturated fats and high in cholesterol. And then we can give them uh, an omega-3 diet with using Manhattan oil, which is fish oil. And these are equally high in fat, 42%, and they're high in cholesterol, but different types of fatty acids. And we'll feed them for periods anywhere from two weeks to 12 weeks. And I'll show you some results of these uh, feeding studies. So these are insulin resistant mice that are fed for 12 weeks on the different diets. Actually, these aren't the mice, these are their livers uh, at the end of the feeding after they've been sacrificed. And uh, three different ma magnifications here, 10, 20, and 40. This is the chow fed. And here we're using oil red O staining to uh, look for basically liver triglyceride, and that stays red. And we can see that with the Western SAT diet, the McDonald's diet, these mice get marked fatty livers. They get non-alcoholic fatty liver disease with high transaminases. And then when we, where is it? Here it is. On the omega-3 diet, same high fat, high, same high cholesterol, uh, they normalize their liver triglycerides. They normalize their abnormal transaminases, and uh, basically we get normal livers with omega-3 uh, high fat diets. And uh, we've shown that with the omega-3, we decrease transcription factors that lead to high production of fatty acids and triglycerides. And uh, so therefore we hypothesized that increasing omega-3 fatty acid intake will be uh, proved to be a beneficial adjunct in managing the most common cause of liver disease now in North America and in Europe, NAFLD. And in fact, in uh, England, South, Southampton, uh, Philip Calder and his group are now showing that if you give omega-3 supplements, you can actually normalize liver triglyceride in NAFLD. But the interesting thing is that it only works in certain genotypes, and it does not work in all genotypes. So this may be important later, and we'll mention it again, in how do we interpret findings relating to omega-3 fatty acids. Now what about the cardiovascular benefits? And again, these are sort of listed here. Um, studies showing reduced sudden death, reduced arrhythmias, triglyceride lowering, etc., lower blood pressure. But still the basic mechanisms are not all that well understood. And this is one of the slides uh, from the GC Prevencioni study, which is secondary prevention after an event, a cardio, uh, cardiovascular event, mainly heart attacks, showing that uh, overall mortality decreases uh, in the group that was given uh, one gram a day of omega-3 supplements after a myocardial event, and the, this is total mortality. But what we can see is that even three, three and a half months after the event, you're seeing uh, uh, better outcomes with the omega-3 supplemented group. So uh, we're, we turn back to mice now where we did, uh, this is just one slide of dietary studies in LDL receptor uh, knockout mice who were prone to atherosclerosis on a Western diet. And we're looking here at the aorta just above the aortic valve on chow and sat and omega-3 diets. And again, we're staining these uh, aorta with H&E plus oil red O to stain for fat in atherosclerotic lesions. And what you can see on the chow, uh, very little athro. Uh, on the sat, 
many atherosclerotic lesions, and the omega-3, very little atherosclerotic lesions, even though it's high fat, high cholesterol. And on the bottom here, we actually quantitate the uh, lesion area in the aorta, and we can see here on the McDonald's diet, uh, huge increases in uh, atherosclerotic lesion uh, er um, uh, area in the aorta. But look what happens here if you replace part, just as, this is 20-25% of the high SAT diet with fish oil. And you get a marked decrease in, uh, where is it, there's a pointer, with, uh, you get a marked decrease in uh, the number of lesions, and this is pure, the pure omega-3. So even a little bit of omega-3 is effective in the presence of a high-fat diet in increasing lesion size. And I'm not going to show you all the slides, all, all the data we have in our lab, but we've, there's many mechanisms whereby the omega-3s seem to have beneficial effects uh, in uh, decreasing atherosclerotic development from decreasing arterial uh, wall lipid de uh, deposition, decreasing pro-inflammatory cytokines in the aorta, uh, decreasing pro-inflammatory cells, and increasing anti-inflammatory lipid mediators in the uh, arterial wall. So they're anti-atherogenic in mice. And uh, we're pretty excited about some more recent studies we're doing at the same time, uh, where we ask the question, uh, might acute treatment, this acute, that's not chronic dietary supplements or increases the amount of fish oil, will acute, acute treatment with omega-3 packaged in triglycerides, in lipid emulsion, so intralipid is a lipid emulsion, uh, will they protect the heart, myocardium, and brain after ischemic reperfusion injury, after heart attacks and stroke in animal models. And uh, I'll show you, uh, these are studies after we tie off the left anterior descending coronary artery in mice. Uh, we tie it off for about an hour and then we open up the thing, we cause a heart attack. And uh, then we look at the mice uh, 48 hours later. And you can see here that these are, uh, this is the, the uh, heart, this is the left ventricle. You can see it's a little paler. And we can actually measure the infarcted uh, left ventricle uh, dead tissue from the myocardial infarct. And uh, we stain it with something called TTC. We can quantitate it. So this is the size of the infarct in sort of control mice, uh, given a saline injection. And this is the, where is it? This is the infarct in mice that are injected after the event, two injections of omega-3 rich triglyceride emulsions. And you see much smaller infarct size. And this is shown here. This is the saline injected mice in terms of infarct size and marked decreases in infarct size after the omega-3 injection. They decrease uh, LDH, this is LDH, that's measured uh, after the infarct. In the yellow is again the omega-3, lower LDH, CPK. Uh, and uh, when we, before sacrifice, we do echocardiograms and uh, 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 EKGs on these mice and we can see, um, without going through the details, that the mice who got the omega-3 injection actually preserve myocardial function. And without uh, showing you all the data, we've uh, uncovered quite a number of mechanisms whereby the uh, omega-3 uh, fatty acids protect the heart after uh, myocardial infarction by decreasing ischemic markers, decreasing arrhythmia, decreasing uh, 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 autophagy and apoptosis, preserving cardiac function and myocyte uh, survival. Now, 
Let's switch to stroke. Stroke is the uh, myocardial infarction in the United States major killer. Uh, depending on the year, stroke is num ischemic stroke is number one, uh, sorry, number three or four uh, in terms of killer. It's a major cause, though, a cost in terms of morbidity uh, in the United States. And uh, so this is an ischemic stroke where uh, we have blockage of an artery in the brain and you get a uh, ischemic area, an infarcted area in the brain. And in fact, uh, unlike MI, very effective post-stroke treatments uh, are really not available. Like TPA only gets to a small number and uh, of those that are successful, it's still uh, less than 5%. So we don't have a lot of good treatments for stroke. Uh, so we question whether there might be a role for omega-3 fatty acids in stroke. And the reason is that if we look at the pathobiology of ischemic brain or ischemic tissues in general, uh, there's many pathways that sort of lead to infarction and loss of function. And some of them occur within minutes, some within hours, and some within days. And on that green circle uh, shows pathways that we have studied uh, in our group that are relevant to ischemic brain uh, from production of reactive oxygen species, calcium fluxes, uh, inflammatory mediators, and mitochondrial function, which are all markedly affected by hypoxic ischemic injury. And uh, we postulated that these pathways uh, would be affected in a positive way by acute injection of omega-3 fatty acids in triglycerides after the event. And in fact, this is very consistent. Uh, so we've done this in a number of rodent models. And what you're looking here on the top of the slide are coronal sections of brain after we tie off the right carotid artery in a mouse or a rat, which because of the circle of Willis is not sufficient to cause a stroke. So we put them in a hypoxemic chamber, 8% oxygen for about 15 to 20 minutes, and that causes a stroke in the right hemisphere. And what we're looking here on the top is uh, brain stained with uh, this compound called TTC, which stains live mitochondria red. Uh, and the infarcted areas here are in white. Uh, that's the stroke area. Uh, and this is measured uh, 24 hours after the stroke. And these are the strokes in um, that we quantitate across the whole brain in uh, saline injected mice after the stroke. And here is after the omega-3 injections with uh, emulsions where 48% of the fatty acids are EPA and DHA. These are omega-3 uh, rich triglyceride emulsions. This is the juvenile rat. This is the uh, sort of injury score uh, or infarct volume. Uh, in saline in red, and here is the stroke infarct after omega-3, two injections, one hour apart after the event. And this is in juvenile rat, where is it there, and adult mouse and neonatal mouse. Marked neuroprotection after acute injection of omega-3 fatty acids. And the interesting thing is that we can give a, the first injection two hours after the stroke, and we get equal neuroprotection as if we give it zero hours after the stroke delay. And we're doing experiments right now in rats, which have a longer therapeutic window, and we're going up to, we think, we don't have all the data yet, but if this is going on this week, and I mean, we did the experiments two weeks, we're quantitating the areas right now. We think we're getting neuroprotection four to six hours. We have a therapeutic window of four to six hours 
after the stroke in rats, which we think because uh, rats and mice have much faster metabolic rates than humans, that the therapeutic window in humans will be longer than TPA, but don't quote me on that yet. <laughs> uh, and we've done a lot of work on the mechanisms. This is just one slide where we take the mito isolate mitochondria from the affected and non-affected areas of brain 30 to 60 minutes after the stroke. So this is before you see any dead brain, any infarcted brain. And we look at production of reactive oxygen species from the isolated mitochondria. And without going into details, we see that after the omega-3, before anything's happening on the, where you can see anything on the cellular level by the microscope, we have marked decreases in reactive oxygen species uh, production in the mitochondria, marked decreases in free radical production. So we have quite a number of mechanisms which we've defined uh, relating to mitochondria. And just in general, we've done this in five rodent models, including right middle cerebral artery uh, occlusion. Uh, we've decreased brain edema. We increase these catabolites of uh, DHA, which are called neuroprotectin D1, decreased ROS. Uh, we maintain calcium bu buffering capacity. And very interestingly, I guess, not only is the infarct volume and neurofunction preserved at 24 hours, but when we sacrifice, we keep the mice going for eight weeks. This is two months after two injections, no continuation of a high omega-3 diet. We have marked decreases in brain loss, and we have preservation of neurofunction after two injections eight weeks later. So they're basically protected long-term as well as short-term uh, after the omega-3 treatment. So that we can postulate from some of our own lab work that uh, omega-3 fatty acids are potential bioactive and therapeutic agents in NAFLD. Uh, in atherosclerosis, and in terms of acute treatment, which is sort of novel, uh, in protection uh, of the effects of myocardial infarction and stroke. So this is all in animal models. What about people? What about humans? So on top here, is the GC Prevenzioni uh, trial. Good results with omega-3 supplements. Oh, and on the bottom, let's see. Uh, circulation 2010, chronic dietary supplement of omega-3 after an event. Uh, doesn't matter if I say which is the blue and which is the red because there's no difference. Hmm. And then we look at different papers. So the happy heart uh, with omega-3, they're there on the left, starting with the studies in Eskimos, GC Prevenzioni, the jealous studies in Japan, which was EPA supplementation, uh, different systematic reviews, etc., all for omega-3 fatty acids. But look, oh, on the right, uh, um, hmm, not so happy in terms of omega-3 fatty acids in uh, diff different types of omega-3 trials and uh, systematic reviews. Uh, now you'll notice, look, look at the years of the pro-omega-3 and the non-pro-omega-3, there's a time difference. There seems to be some kind of shifting. So what's going on? Uh, here, here's a paper um, from the New England Journal in 2010, which showed no beneficial effects of omega-3 after an event, this is a secondary prevention trial. And uh, if you actually read the methods of this paper, you find some interesting things. Number one, the median time of supplementation with omega-3 fatty acids 
was 3.75 years, not months, years after the event. So a lot of things happened in 3.75 years. The supplement was given in margarine. 16 grams of margarine were given a day and to the margarine was added 400 milligrams of EPA and DHA. Now margarine contains a lot of linoleic acid. In fact, seven grams of omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids were given. And polyunsaturated fats actually have benefits. So you see there's a lot of funny things going on with some study designs. So this paper, even though it was reviewed by a friend of mine, should never have been in the New England Journal. Anyways, <laughs> uh, and then, without going through many papers, here's what's emerging. So this is a study uh, from Australia headed by Paul Nestle. Paul Nestle is one of the major leaders in omega-3 fatty acids, one of the early ones to recognize its cardiovascular benefits. But this came out, when did it, it came out last summer, I think. Uh, the results and conclusions of this sort of systematic review from Australia is higher fish intake was associated with lower incident rates of heart failure, et cetera, cardiac death. But the benefit were seen in subjects who had higher fish intake, but omega-3 long chain supplementation had neither beneficial nor adverse effects. So supplements aren't working as well as fish. So the majority here who eat fish twice a week seem to be maybe on the right track. And if we look at stroke, uh, we reviewed a few years ago many studies, clinical studies of fish and supplement intake in stroke uh, prevention. So these are chronic dietary either supplements or cried di uh, dietary intakes. And again, it's a mixed bag in terms of outcomes of uh, clinical trials with varying results um, in different parts of the world. And then the British Medical Journal uh, publishes uh, here this article, I guess it's October 2012, that there are inverse associations of fish and long chain omega-3 fatty acid consumption with cerebrovascular stroke risk. But supplements in primary and secondary prevention trials were not effective. So it was fish that was effective, but not supplements. So the question is, uh, how do we deal with this question of fish versus omega-3 supplements. And a big problem in the field is th these studies are not like taking a tiny statin. Tiny, you know. The, the, these are big changes in sort of macro and micronutrients. And many of the studies, when you go through the literature, it's really looking at apples and oranges uh, and trying to compare them and make evaluations. So when we look at the different outcomes of omega-3 trials, there's many, many things that you find in the literature that might explain different types of outcomes, from the baseline intakes, Japan, which has high basal intakes, to countries like Bulgaria, which has the lowest intakes in the world, and high cardiovascular risk. Uh, are we changing the omega-6 uh, intakes at the same time, which may have effects? What are the input? Some studies are three months duration, uh, primary versus secondary, the timing of the uh, intervention, 3.5 years, 3.75 years in that New England paper, using and comparing studies with alpha linolenic acid versus EPA and or DHA, more recent studies in dysglycemia or other conditions, 
which may have prior, you know, much bigger effects on cardiovascular effects, effects than the um, omega-3. Again, different criteria for meta-analysis. And what I would now call is what's going to be, what's the role of not just pre precision medicine, but precision genomics. Because as I showed you, NAFLD, uh, only certain genotypes are responsive to omega-3. So what do we do about it? Omega-3 fatty acids and cardiovascular disease, uh, where do we go from here? So this is a, uh, a study by Dr. Mozaferian when he was at Harvard, uh, with Rin, and he's now at Tufts, he's head of nutrition at Tufts, uh, on pooled analyses of different studies of cardiac death. Uh, with the relative risk of cardiac death compared to the EPA and DHA daily intakes. Um, so there's quite a number of studies here. Now, so the average mean intake of omega-3 EPA and DHA in the United States is about 60 to 100 milligrams a day. That's we're just around here. And what Dr. Mozaferian showed in numerous studies that if you sort of look at the relative risk and plot them, that the uh, decrease really plateaus out, if you will, at our intakes of around 250 milligrams uh, per day, about two grams a week of EPA and DHA. So that's not a lot. So we can, we can sort of think now that if we look at different organizations from the American Heart Association to uh, Australia to uh, WHO, that the general recommendations are that we should be having intakes of EPA and DHA for cardiovascular disease of about 250 to 500 milligrams a day. The AHA says if you've had a cardiac event, it should be close to about a, a, a thousand milligrams a day. So I would suggest that EPA and DHA are bioactive missing micronutrients acting via multiple mechanisms to promote health and possibly treat and prevent multiple conditions. Now, statins are pleiotropic molecules. They just have more actions than lowering cholesterol. And from some of the slides I've shown you here, we can also say that omega-3s are pleiotropic molecules. But what seems to be emerging is that if we take omega-3s by, let's say, two to three fatty fish meals a week, they seem to be more protective than if we take them as supplements. Uh, right now, there's a trial going on called the VITAL trial, which is going to be studying uh, close to 26,000 men and women uh, for different arms with vitamin D, uh, omega-3 supplements uh, in different combinations with, out, uh, with uh, endpoints, which are after about five years, going to measure cancer risk, cardiovascular disease, risk factors and events, etc. So we're still awaiting this trial, but again, it's a supplement trial. It's not a fish trial. And I would also like to suggest that acute treatment with uh, omega-3, DHA, and EPA uh, could be beneficial for acute cardiovascular disease therapeutics. Now, a major question is most of the dose effects are done in relation to cardiovascular disease. But should we have different omega-3 and omega-6 intakes in different health disease arenas or areas for reproductive outcomes, brain development, uh, cardiovascular disease, NAFLD, uh, mental health, immune inflammatory disorders? So there's still a lot of information that we need to gather in terms of potential beneficial effects of omega-3 fatty acids. 
Uh, and we have another dilemma, is that in general, fish, in, uh, fish oil intakes or EPA and DHA intakes worldwide are much lower than 250 to 500 milligrams per day. And without going through the details here, but the worldwide production of EPA and DHA is not sufficient to meet those requirements that I have just suggested, 250 to uh, 500 milligrams a day, another dilemma. In fact, uh, looking at different sources of where we get omega-3, EPA, and DHA from in human consumption, we actually have a gap uh, from uh, the omega-3 supply of 1.1 million metric tons a year. So it's not, we can't really fill it, uh, f fill it with the decreasing uh, fish populations of the world, so we have to think of other sources. And uh, uh, William Hazlitt was a writer, philosopher, critic, thinker uh, a number of years ago. And he suggested that when a thing ceases to be a subject of controversy, it ceases to be a subject of interest. And that's where we are with omega-3s. And I'd like to thank the NIH for funding our research, uh, individuals in my lab who are listed here who have uh, produced most experiments that I showed you today, and as well, wonderful collaborating labs, both within uh, Columbia University uh, and outside of Columbia University. Thank you very much. I just wondered, when you talk about fatty fish, would you, uh, like, so are you talking about mackerel and sal salmon, uh, but not tilapia and trout? I mean, would you give us some exam practical examples? Okay, so uh, we wrote, we, a number of people have written, so the, the, the fish that are rich in omega-3 are sardines, herring, mackerel, Salmon, tuna, uh, left out one or two. And, but the thing is, if you want to think about toxins that may be associated with fish, you don't want to eat too much omega-3s from very big, long-living fish like tuna. Uh, we've had cases of people that really eat sushi, uh, five to six times a week, and they have high mercury levels. Uh, now, the, you mentioned tilapia and uh, other kinds of warm water fish. So they're not supposed to have high levels of omega-3. But we're actually doing studies right now in East Africa, uh, and we've had uh, graduate students in the, who are looking at, uh, in Lake Victoria, at, West Nile perch, and we're looking at tilapia in Lake Baringo, which is uh, sort of western Kenya. And they are actually rich in, these are warm water fish, and they are rich in omega-3s because they eat algae and plants that are rich in omega-3. So this is something actually we're working on actively to see if feeding, or if, if the fish are eating plants or algae that are rich in omega-3, they may actually be good sources of omega-3 as well. So, uh, I have one question. What is, the, what is the data, if any, for protection against AKI? Because all of the mechanisms that you've mentioned could be beneficial in AKI, ischemia reperfusion. That's what, is there any data for use of uh, uh, fatty acids, alpha omega-3 fatty acids for prevention of AKI? That's acute in Kidney injury. Kidney injury. Kidney injury. Kidney injury. Kidney injury. So, uh, <laughs> one, no evidence. Two, we want to study it because, because we think that some of the basic mechanisms would be effective. So, in fact, uh, this, is some, this is an area that we've written about that we 
Yeah, so post, we, we, we post-cardiac surgery or in transplant, you know, yeah. you graft function. Right. You just give me all the mechanisms you mentioned. Right. All the same. So we predict that it'll be effective. Yeah. No, no data. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so do you or your lab members eat a lot more fish? Sorry? Do you or your lab members eat a lot more fish? Uh, <laughs> well, my wife uh, is a vegetarian who eats fish. So at home, we eat a lot of fish. Uh, two of my lab members are vegetarians. Uh, and I think, yeah, just in general, we, we tend to eat a lot of fish. Uh, uh, I eat meat when I go out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Uh, what is the role of omega 3s in cancer and also in other inflammatory conditions like inflammatory bowel disease? So, roles in cancer. Uh, there are some articles that in certain types of cancer it may be beneficial, and they usually come out with um, papers, and then other papers come out and show they have uh, no effects. So, that's still open. Uh, about a couple of years ago, there was a, a big noise about perhaps high intakes of omega-3 being associated with higher risk of bad prostate cancer. And in fact, when you look at the actual primary, it was, the, the study wasn't an omega-3 trial. It was, a, kind of, what was that? It was a, it came out of uh, uh, Anderson, uh, whatever. And uh, when you actually look at the difference in the groups, they were tiny, tiny in our labs and our uh, GC mass spec analysis. We wouldn't call, cause, you know, uh, think these differences were significant. But when you have 8,000 subjects, you get a good p-value. Uh, and uh, the other one was in uh, inflammatory, inflammatory bowel disease. So one of the first papers in New England Journal actually showed that it increased remission at times in Crohn's disease. Uh, subsequent papers have not shown so. And I think, you know, when I mention precision genomics, that's where we have to be moving in terms of responses to omega-3. That some people are going to be more responsive to this type of agent than another, and I think omega-3 is going to definitely fall into that class. Um, back to the transcription, um, what are the differences between, for example, farm wild salmon versus uh, farm salmon? Uh, with uh, Farm salmon, it really depends on what you feed them. <laughs> and with wild salmon, they uh, have high levels. But you can have omega-3 and a rich or omega-3 farm salmon, depending on what you feed them, and the temperature in which you grow them. Yes? You had a question already. <laughs> a great summary of a lot of information. You mentioned in passing statins which have some of the benefits uh, you're proposing for omega 3s What, if anything, do we know about the additive benefits? In other words, when people are already on statins, how much additional benefit would there be from omega 3 So I think the JELUS trial in Japan uh, was actually with patients on statins who were supplemented with EPA, and there was benefit. Uh, other trials have shown no benefit. I think one of the the changing things in cardiovascular disease, that if you look at the, the times when the, uh, we got all those positive trials versus the times more recently where we get the negative trials, especially with supplements, is that the treatments have actually, the acute treatments have got better in terms of handling uh, myocardial infarction with all the other medications that are used to treat MI. So it may be, I think what we need to really look forward towards is, well, the vital trial, but I'm nervous because it's a supplement. And the supplement, by the way, is an ethyl ester. Uh, so what the, the largest selling supplement right now, I don't know if I'm allowed to mention names, but it's out there uh, that by prescription, is an ethyl ester. So what is it? And, and a lot of the trials, this is an interesting thing, ethyl esters are poorly absorbed unless you do it postprandially with fat in the meal. So the absorption is lousy when you're fasting. And a lot of the trials paid no attention as to whether the supplements are given during the fed or fasting state or with a fat 
fatty meal or not. So there's a big mess out there in terms of the crime. And I, I'm not sure what's happening in Vital, whether they're giving it with, uh, with uh, uh, fat meal. It's a different question. Where's avocado oil on the scale of goodness for oils? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think it's good, by the way. Okay. I might have had it back. <laughs> One last question in the back there. Has anybody looked at populations, that is, Eskimos versus Bulgarians, who obviously are taking much different diets, as opposed to giving your uh, omega threes to somebody who's had an acute MI? Yes. Has anybody looked at them to see the size of a myocardial infarction, the size of a stroke? Not really the size, but I actually gave a, uh, a, a talk in November at the University of Sofia in, in Bulgaria. So I did a bit of research, and it turns out that two Bulgarian postdocs working in Boston with Walter Willett at Harvard actually did a study on uh, fish intakes and adipose tissue fatty acid omega-3 composition in different populations. Well, lo and behold, Bulgaria comes out as but one of the lowest in the world, even though they're on the Black Sea, and, but they, don't, they just don't eat fish, and it's a lot of meat. And uh, cardiovascular disease uh, uh, mortality in Bulgaria is among the highest in Europe, early heart disease. But in Bulgaria, they also smoke uh, quite a bit, and there's other f confounders. But in general, there's a graph from uh, that paper that really you can correlate omega-3 uh, intakes, uh, the higher intakes, with the overall in general uh, decreasing prevalence rates of cardiovascular disease mortality. Thank you very much. For Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.